That was an interview with the Senate spokesman, Senator Aliyu Abdullahi. Next, we spoke with two public analysts who closely monitored the National Assembly in 2016. The National Assembly, let me, let me speak about the positives of the National Assembly first. In 2016. In 2016. You know, despite the initial challenges, leadership crisis, uh, the National Assembly has gradually found its rhythm in 2016. It has become, you know, vibrant and lively. Okay, and one of the ways you can assess uh, the fact that the National Assembly has, has come alive, if, if you consider the fact that between June 2016 and December, 2016, like the Senate President did announce in his short closing remarks, the Senate passed a total number of 24 bills, okay? By every measure, that is quite a remarkable and unprecedented achievement. So you can't take it away that the National Assembly has been, you know, quite vibrant. But I will, when we talk about the negatives, I will interrogate the content and the social implication of those bills. But you just have to admit that they've done so well, okay? Uh, if you look at the National Assembly too, there was something they did when they came back from the, their long vacation. By the time they were about going on their long vacation, the inf information we were told that Nigeria was uh, undergoing a partial recession, but during their long vacation, the Minister of Finance came out to confirm that Nigeria was in full recession. And uh, the National Assembly resumed and rose to the occasion. What did they do? The first activity of the National Assembly, particularly the Senate, was to have a special session where they debate, debated and discussed how to contribute to Nigeria exiting the, the recession period. And they came up with a 11-point roadmap, which they submitted to the executive as their own contribution to exiting the recession. I think that was a remarkable, you know, achievement by the uh, National Assembly. Well, having said that, you know, there are some negatives about the National Assembly. If you look at those laws, 24 laws or there about that they passed within six months. You know, you could see that uh, those laws didn't have much to do with the, you know, social lives of Nigerians. Take the last eight, the last eight laws that were assented to by the president two days ago. Let me, let me just read them out to underscore the point I'm making. One of them was Water Resource Amendment Act 2016. The other one is Be Import Control and Management Amendment Act 2016. The other one was is a, uh, the Produce Enforcement of Export Standards Amendment Act 2016. The National Agricultural Land Development Authority Amendment Act 2016. The Telecom and um, Postal Offenses Amendment Act. It goes on and on and on like that till eight. And you ask yourself, how do these uh, laws impact on the life of Nigerians? particularly given the recession period we're undergoing. One had expected that the National Assembly and indeed the Senate would have concentrated with those uh, uh, laws that would impact very positively in the lives of Nigerians. Take this issue of the PIB. As we speak, that legislation, that bill has remained in the National Assembly for the past six years or thereabouts. And that was one of the bills that the senior president assured Nigerians they were going to give expedite a consideration on. And indeed, I recall that in June, the senior president did promise that uh, the House of Representatives and the Senate have had their own versions of the PIB, and they were going to harmonize it and present it as the National Assembly version of the PIB. And as we speak, that bill never saw the light of the day. The one we are dealing with is a private member PIB bill, the one that has just passed the um, second reading. To that effect, you begin to wonder. Uh, if you might, uh, maybe we'll come to this later. If we look at the anti-corruption policy of the federal government, 
one would have expected that uh, the National Assembly, which is uh, populated by the leading uh, APC, would have been in the vanguard for the prosecution of this anti-corruption uh, fight. But we're not seeing that. And what do I mean? Legislation-wise, legislation you can't see the National Assembly come up with any legislation that seems to support the anti-corruption you know, fight of the federal government. Instead, they have been the ones frustrating that, uh, that war. Let me give you an example. Take the issue of the Code of Conduct Bureau and Code of Conduct Tribunal. It's uh, common knowledge that the, the Senate and the House of Representatives in a bid to shoot down and whittle down the powers of uh, the, the Bureau and the Tribunal, you know, clearly faulted because the issue of the CCB and CCT Act are clear constitutional uh, you know, acts which they are not supposed to legislate upon. And as we speak, you know the leader in the House, Femi Baja Biamela, is already, you know, coming with a motion to withdraw the assent the, the House gave to that bill. Okay? These are instances to, that shows you that the National Assembly hasn't been quite supportive of the government in its war against uh, uh, anti-corruption. The functions of the National Assembly, of the legislature, uh, you must address this question from that perspective. What are their functions? Uh, they have three core bas basic functions, uh, representation, lawmaking, and of course, oversight. You know, these, if you uh, want to do an assessment of the National Assembly, it must necessarily come from these prisms. Uh, with respect to lawmaking, which is the one that is common, you know, usually uh, easy to... Uh, uh, to measure in tangible terms. Okay, we have done this number of bills. The Senate, for instance, says they have done uh, about 405 bills, according to Senate spokesman. Uh, the House of Reps says they have done about uh, 551 bills, uh, been introduced into you know plenary in the last one year. These are tangibles, and these are all within the stream of lawmaking. And I mean, that's uh, the question would be these bees and these processes, how much value have they added or are they supposed to add to the lives of Nigerians? That's another question altogether, which uh, probably we we'll need to address, you know. But with respect to uh, representation, again, I, I, I think that um, uh, the assessment would be also, uh, may also be conducted within the realms of. Uh, um, one, uh, how they have treated petitions that have come to the National Assembly in both houses, because petitions, uh, you know, are very important uh, ways of uh, measuring representation because uh, constituents have to bring issues that bother them, issues of um, illegal dismissal or lawful dismissal from work and all the likes. They have to. Uh, many people don't know that, but that's a very core function of the legislature that uh, the public needs to engage members of the National Assembly on. You know, they need to tell us just how much they have done with respect to petitions that have come on both floors of um, the National Assembly and what processes have been taken, what stages they are, so that people can monitor these things. If they do that pretty much, it will help in the evaluation of uh, the representation function of uh, the National Assembly. The representation also, we can also look at it from the perspective of um, what they have attracted to their constituencies. That's, of course, within the realm of constituency projects, which is, again, another contentious issue. Uh, it's very controversial. People say it should not be. Uh, there should be no constituency projects. People say there should be constituency projects. So opinions are clearly divided. Of course, it tends to weigh uh, against the side of the National Assembly, which requires or which says it needs constituency projects. I do think that they need constituency projects. I think that the country needs constituency projects. Nigeria is too wide, diverse, and varied to allow decision making and allocation of values, which is politics, to just come from one stream or one arm of government.